Welcome back, everyone. We're here today with this weekend's start to our host calls. The Cabral host calls are every Saturday and Sunday answering our community's questions each and every weekend and happy and excited to get started uh, this week with your questions. We do try to answer six per day. So basically, I open up my big Ask Cabral document from all the different questions that come in on a weekly basis. And uh, we try to keep up answering about a dozen questions or so each weekend. Today's episode 1905. If you'd like to follow along, you can go to stephencabral.com forward slash 1905. And let's see, today is April 24th. And the first question is coming in from let's see, March 13th or so, right around there. So it does look like, uh, again, we're about uh, five to six weeks behind. That's typical for us. I always like to keep you updated on a weekly basis because if you did write in a number of weeks ago, uh, it's not abnormal that uh, your question won't be answered for about six months, uh, sorry, about six weeks. So um, again, just uh, please try to stay patient with us. We're answering all the questions in the order they are received. And I would say if you do need same day help, feel free to ask that question at cabralsupportgroup.com. That's our online uh, support group with over 11,000 people from all around the world joining together to improve their overall health, uh, their body transformation, and their anti-aging based protocols. All right. First question of the day is from Megan. Megan's asking, hi, Dr. C. Love your work. I'm writing in to try to better understand in your own experience, wild yam, and the benefits to someone with low progesterone. There seems to be a lot of warnings out there about using it but keen to better understand a research perspective, how it actually helps to boost progesterone when it seems to be the common understanding that it doesn't actually appear to be able to convert to di, uh, diocinogen outside of the body. Di, diocinogen, that's how you pronounce that. Uh, are there any issues with this raising estrogen and DHEA further for people with elevated levels of those? Could this be beneficial for fertility? to help supercharge the cervical mucus and potentially increase chance of embryo sticking. Keen to hear how, why you are now using it in one of your new products when and when to use it. If so, can the wild yam cream be just as effective? Thank you so much. Okay, really great questions. There's a ton of questions to unpack within this. Uh, I've been using wild yam in my practice for women with low progesterone and potentially lower levels of estrogen for over 10 years. So this is not necessarily new. Maybe it's new as a product that Equal Life is carrying, but We've always used it in our practice, and we've always recommended products. So, you know, I don't know exactly um, what that means, but we've always used the products for sure. So, why have we used it? Well, the thing is, with wild yam, it, it does not contain progesterone. So, I don't want to say that it does, and it also does not convert to progesterone, and it doesn't convert to estrogen. So, that diocinogen, the diocinogen, yes, um, that has estrogen-like qualities to it as a phytoestrogen, but it's not an estrogen itself. And it's not going to convert to estrogen in the body either. But with by using this product, and again, I've used this, I mean, hundreds, if not thousands of times in my practice, is that it'd be like, a, it'd be like akin to using DHEA for low cortisol and low progesterone. Now, DHEA is not going to convert to progesterone, and it's not going to convert to cortisol. However, what seems to happen is that cortisol satisfies, if you take cortisol, sorry, if you take a DHEA, it satisfies more of the calling in your body for the sex hormones because DHEA is a precursor to estrogen and testosterone. And if that's satisfied, then more of your own natural progesterone and cortisol or natural hormone can be shifted towards progesterone and cortisol. And it works. And that is the working theory as to why it works. We know it does work. And the same seems to be true with wild yams for most women. Of course, not everything works for everyone. Uh, but it does not seem to increase estrogen in the body. It does not seem to increase DHEA in the body. It does seem to allow for a balancing and normal level of those two, but also a progesterone as well. So that's what we use it. Um, again, we mainly use it uh, in that fashion for lower hormones, lower progesterone as well. And there are no known side effects that I've seen. Uh, I mean, honestly, from a clinical perspective as well as online, I, I don't see these clinical um, side effects. Maybe you've read about them, uh, but I certainly have not. So, Megan, hopefully that's helpful, and uh, that is how we use it in my practice. And again, uh, 
quite successful. And again, we only use, <laughs> I just want to keep in mind, we only use things that are successful. Uh, we have no ties to WildYam, and, uh, and we don't use it as its only product, by the way. We use it as a synergist to other products. So you might get benefit from WildYam cream, there's no doubt about it, but we typically use it, um, we're typically using it as part of a synergistic-based herbal uh, pro protocol as well, along with magnesium, adrenal soothe, and balancing blood sugar, etc. All right, Chelsea's up next. My six-month-old son has been diagnosed with a peanut allergy. I've listened to your previous podcast where you recommend running an organic acid test and a stool test to see if there are any candida or leaky gut. I'm wondering if this allergy could have anything to do with heavy metals, potentially from vaccines, and if I should run a test for that. Also, I just found out that our home has mold, so we're moving right away to hopefully solve that problem. Do you have any protocols for babies this young? Any advice would be greatly appreciated. Thanks for all you do. And these are all great questions, and of course, obviously troubling for any mother uh, with their six-month-old son to have potentially yeast overgrowth or mold or any of these things, heavy metals. So peanut allergies is an interesting one because we could say that something happened in utero, something uh, a child was exposed to, the mother was exposed to, heavy metals they might be exposed to. We don't exactly know. So that, that's just something that I do want to put out there because I'm always honest about all of my answers. And this is, um, keep in mind, an allergy is different than a sensitivity. So an allergy is uh, a true, and with peanut, typically anaphylactic-based issue. So we might be able to lessen the degree of that allergy, but oftentimes the allergy persists. It's different than a sensitivity. A sensitivity would be mediated by a different part of the immune system, or an allergy is mediated by more of that IgA um, and potentially IgE basis of the immune system. Okay, so what do we do? Well, here's the thing. We could run the labs for a six-month-old, but I don't recommend it. Because really what we need to do, and but I have, so keep in mind I have, uh, there are pediatric collection bags that you can get from the lab where they can just put this inside of their diaper and when they urinate, it fills up a bag. So it's not, you can, you can do this and I've done it in rare cases. But what we need to do, especially if your child's still nursing, is to make sure that you're eating good, healthy, clean foods, cruciferous vegetables if possible, bringing up your own sulfur-based amino acids in your body, bringing up your own vitamin C, your own zinc, your own stores, uh, making sure that this child, that maybe they're going to start to wean as well, is eating a lot of these good, healthy foods, brightly colored foods as well, so they're boosting their own detox-based capabilities. But we don't do protocols uh, for really anyone under the age of two years old or under the, under the weight of 30 pounds. So... Um, what we do is we rely on the mother's immune system as they're nursing their children, if they are nursing, to be able to pass on a lot of those white blood cells and, and immune cells for the child. Hopefully that's helpful. Alida is up next. L A L I D A. Hi, Stephen. I've been struggling with chronic eyes for almost a year, and nobody can help me find the root cause of it and make it stop. All the doctors do is give me pills and creams to cover up what is going on. They are helping anyway. To give you a little background, I'm 42, female, overweight. I had a hysterectomy four years ago, acid reflux when I was 20, taking an acid blocker for 22 years, found I had a tumor in my pituitary gland that's causing adrenal insufficiency taking five milligrams of prednisone for this. I have sleep apnea. Among all these, the hives is definitely the worst to deal with. Of course, I still want to make everything better, but the constant hives and itching is extremely bothersome. I've tried a couple of different diets with no success. I'm hoping you are able to help. Okay, so I am able to help. Uh, I have done many, many shows on hives. So if you go to stephencabral.com forward slash podcasts and you type in hives or urticaria, then you will see all of the different shows for all of the different underlying reasons. Typically, it's intestinal permeability and leaky gut. And there's a really high likelihood you may have that. Again, I don't provide any medical diagnosis, any medical treatment plans, or any medical cures. I look at underlying root causes for things. So what I highly recommend is I did a show just this past Tuesday, the root cause of allergies... And that's on uh, 1901. Now, keep in mind, hives would be kind of a form of an allergic reaction, right? It's a cytokine, it's a histamine-based reaction. One of those can cause that. So I recommend listening to that shows. It's, it's all about intestinal permeability, leaky gut, 
food sensitivities. So my highest recommendation, because you've been on acid blockers for 22 years, so you've most likely allowed some pathogens into that gut, I would run the three gut-based tests. Uh, I really, well, for you, I'd run the big five, and then I would run the stool test as well if you can. And the reason is, we want to look at your cortisol levels. If you're not producing enough cortisol, I know you're taking prednisone, but prednisone is not a substitute for cortisol. Uh, it's, it's just not. Like, that's not it's not the same, right? So when I had Addison's disease, I wasn't producing cortisol. I didn't know really about natural health at the time. I was put on Cortef. Cortef is actually hydrocortisone. You're getting cortisone, cortisol in your body. Uh, but again, we need to rebuild the body. So I don't know. Uh, they found a tumor in your pituitary gland causing adrenal insufficiency. So if this is a root cause, well then, of course, that's an issue. But we really need to say like, okay, well, what kind of adrenal insufficiency is there? Uh, we would run the stress hormones, mood and metabolism test for that. Again, no medical diagnosis or treatment, but certainly once we find the underlying root cause, we can help you to a much greater degree. All of these labs are available at equi.life forward slash labs, E-Q-U-I dot L-I-F-E forward slash labs. I recommend the big five as well as the uh, bacteria and parasite test to look at what's going on with your gut. You'll get the food sensitivity test with that. You'll also get the candida test with that. Uh, and then of course you'll look at your omega threes, which are needed for balancing high levels of inflammation, which could cause hives. So again, that's what I would do. Uh, there's so many question marks as to what it is, but by testing, you can find a lot of these underlying root cause imbalances. Good question. Marty's up next. I've been doing the intermittent fasting for four weeks, 16, eight. I've gained four pounds. Help. All right, Marty. Uh, we actually answered this question as to why the 16, eight diet is really not the best to do, uh, for you for so many different reasons. Let's see if I can find it exactly for you. Let's just see here. Let's just see. Let's just see. All right, we've got the what's happening during your body during the five stages of fasting. Yeah, that's a good one. I've got a I've got one on why you shouldn't skip breakfast. So if you go to stephencabral.com forward slash podcast, why you shouldn't skip breakfast, you'll find that. Um, let's see. I have another one on this is a good one for you. 1880. Go to stephencabral.com forward slash 1880. Five science back reasons not to skip breakfast. And those are good places to start. And that's where I'd begin. And then, of course, if you want additional recommendations, just go to stephencabral.com forward slash podcast and click on the intermittent fasting category. It's going to give you about 30 shows. We have I couldn't believe it. It's it's actually, it's our most popular category. Uh, we have so many people downloading shows just from that one alone on iTunes. Uh, it's just intermittent fasting. So it's all the facts behind it. And, um, and you know, people think the 16-8 is the best. It's, it's not the best. Uh, I did another uh, one on just 16-8 and what happens to your metabolism on that. I mean, there's so many I've done on this. And uh, how people are losing muscle on it, not just body fat, which is really slowing their metabolism. I wish I could find that for you right off the top here, but up oh, there it is. Episode 1783. So there you go. So we've got you a bunch of um, podcasts for you to listen to next, and you will definitely have your answer after listening to those. All right, Sam is up. Hi, Dr. Brawl. I'm wondering if you know anything about betaine trimethylglycine supplementation and methylation. I've read about it in a MTHFR group and in, but haven't found much info on it. My second question is regarding high blood pressure and hormones. What's the connection? If any, I have issues with anxiety and blood pressure despite being thin and eating clean since having my son two years ago. I have not had my hormones tested, but recently did an organ organic acids and hair tissue mineral analysis, and it was recommended that I test hormones as well. Thanks so much. Okay, so uh, betaine can be taken as betaine and hydros, which just means betaine by itself with no water, uh, or you can take betaine HCL, which stands for betaine hydrochloride. I take betaine hydrochloride, and I have for many, many years, to help with protein digestion. So there are many reasons why, but let me give you um, the straight answer. So if you're taking betaine, betaine anhydrous, then you're getting the exact amount of trimethylglycine, which is another name for betaine, as it says. If you're taking 500 milligrams of, above 500 milligrams of, of betaine HCL, you're getting about 360 milligrams of betaine, uh, and then the rest is the chloride part. So here's, here's what you need to know. 
The reason why I take it is that I have all sorts of methylation issues in my genetics. So I use this twofold. One, betaine and HCL helps with me breaking down protein. So I don't take it at breakfast because I have my smoothie, my oatmeal. I take it at lunch and dinner because I have protein at those meals. Um, a larger amount. I, the smoothie has protein as well as about 20, 25 grams. Um, but my lunch and dinner have uh, a stronger type of protein to break down. So that's why I take it. But then the side effect is I also get the methyl donors so that I don't have to take high levels of methylfolate because that contains folate besides the methyl factor, or methylcobalamin, because that contains cobalamin, or B12, and I don't necessarily need super high dosages of those. So I take betaine separately for that. Now, the methyl donor itself will help with whatever you need it for, and that could be detox pathways, it could be cognitive performance, it could be inflammatory-based markers, so I do it for all of the above. I don't take a lot. Um, I literally take uh, B betaine HCL is based on the amount that you need to break down the protein. I simply just take one. That's it. I take one. If I ever have red meat, then I take two. And that's 1,000 milligrams. Some people take more. That's what works for me. I take 500 milligrams at each meal, and it's fantastic. Okay, hopefully that helps. I also take certain products that might deplete uh, methyl donors, and because of that, um, I take the methyl donors with it. All right, I've answered that before, too. I definitely inside of IHP around... Um, products such as nicotinamide riboside. Too many people are taking nicotinamide riboside uh, or nicotinamide mononucleotide without taking trimethylglycine, also known as betaine. And that's a real mistake. It's a real problem. But unfortunately, a lot of formulators and supplement companies um, don't tell that to their consumers, nor do they add it to the product, which I believe, like I said, is a mistake. So uh, hormones and high blood pressure. Okay. Well, we want to think of it this way. If you have inflammation, it can cause high blood pressure. If you have imbalanced hormones, it can cause inflammation. Inflammation can cause high blood pressure. If you have anxiety, it can raise cortisol and norepinephrine, which can cause high blood pressure, vasoconstriction. So all of these are they're absolutely easily explained. I mean, they really are. It does not have to be more complicated than that. It can literally be that. I mean, obviously, I broke it down to brass tacks, but um, you know that's how it works. So you've already done the candida test. You've already done the minerals and metals test, which is fantastic. And yes, I agree with your health coach. Uh, whoever your integrative health practitioner is, I recommend the stress hormones, mood and metabolism test as well. So that's what I would do for sure. Good questions. All right, we're already at the end of our show. We've got Lily up for our last question. Hi, Dr. Brawl. I was wondering if there's a connection between high blood glucose and the gut or gut health. Does one influence the other? I'm asking because I've been wearing a continuous glucose monitor for a few weeks, and it shows that a lot of the foods that I'm currently eating are raising my blood sugar, way above the normal. I also have a history of gut issues, imbalanced gut flora, so I was wondering if there's a connection between the two. Thanks so much in advance for your answer. I appreciate you and all that you do. Lily. Thanks, Lily. Appreciate you. So let's look at it this way. I don't know the composition of your meals, but a lot of people think that carbohydrates alone raise, can raise blood sugar. That, that is true for some people. If you add fiber, typically it slows it down. But... You can eat a meal that's high fat, high protein with no carbs and also raise blood sugar. And that's very well documented. You can even just have a whey protein shake and it will spike blood sugar. So really we're asking why do you have this, it's almost like this, uh, I'm trying to think of the best analogy for you. It's almost like a teeter-totter, right? And so if you're watching this on video, you can see this little marker in my hand. It, it, it sways very easily up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down because the homeostatic influences in your body don't allow it to come back to normal very quickly. So you get these massive fluctuations. This can happen with increased gut permeability. It can happen with gastric emptying, emptying from your stomach, happening too quickly. Uh, it could happen with not the proper amount of protein, amino acids, as well as fiber at meals. I would really have to know what your diet, excuse me, and your actual meals look like that was allowing for the spike. But also, just keep in mind, when you eat food, it's not abnormal for your blood sugar to rise to 120, 130, maybe even 140, but it just should come back down within two hours to three hours maximum below 95. So I might just maybe just have put your mind at ease there. A lot of people believe that their blood sugar should never go up and down. It does go up and down. That's not abnormal. You just want to make sure that you're not getting high highs and also that your blood sugar comes down normally within that two to three hours after a meal. 
So that's your postprandial glucose levels. One little tip for you is that go for a 10, 20 minute walk, just a light walk after you eat. It can, be, it can be absolutely remarkable for helping to balance blood sugar and aid in digestion. All right, that is our show for today. But tomorrow, we'll be back, I'll be back, answering more of your questions here on our next Cabral House Call. Take care. Have an amazing rest of the weekend.